everyone. Welcome to Net Impact Bangkok Professional Chapters uh, luncheon talk. Right. Uh, my pleasure to see you at familiar face again. And welcome everyone back to, to Net Impact. Uh, today we have the other great speaker, uh, Chris Regal. Uh, he's a business development manager at Vietnam. Uh, Chris holds up. Chris holds an MBA focused on international hotels and tourism from Bangkok, and he holds a Bachelor of Science from uh, University of Pennsylvania State University. Uh, to, and today he will be talking about can a smart trash bin save us money. So without further ado, please welcome Chris. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you to Sasson School of Management uh, for having me here today. Uh, thank you everyone as well for coming out and having lunch um, and talking a bit about food waste uh, and the role artificial intelligence can have in reducing that. Um, so I work for Winnow uh, and essentially just introduce myself um, briefly. Uh, my education background has always been in hospitality uh, from a more traditional sense um, in terms of operations from FTB, um, through all my schooling as well and kind of taking a couple different turns um, really throughout my life. Um, working really with uh, sustainability consulting at one point, um, looking at the top of the food waste, as well as bringing hotels through um, environmental certifications. Um, and that, that kind of led me to then go back um, into my master's degree on sustainability with a hospitality focus, um, where I focused my, uh, my master's thesis on food waste prevention in hotels, um, and working with the Club Med in Weekend, actually, to uh, look at this. From there, um, unfortunately, I left the sustainability world for a couple of years uh, to work in hotel development for the Wyndham Hotel Group, um, kind of a very different field of work. Uh, felt like I needed to get back into sustainability because I didn't want to just be building hotels and destroying the environment all over, you know, for the past couple of years. So that's where actually I uh, was fortunate enough to find Winnow. Um, and, and Winnow started six years ago. Um, started with two American gentlemen who actually were college roommates um, at INSEAD. So they were studying together at the time, and essentially after school, um, our one founder, Mark Zorns, who was um, working at McKinsey & Company um, at the time, was doing research on uh, resource loss and looking and seeing what were the actual, uh, what, what were the resource losses, the main resource losses that we could see, and what were the business opportunities in addressing these resource losses. And what we saw, uh, what Mark saw actually, was that, um, that food waste actually came in as the third uh, most uh, I would say the most, giving us the most opportunity to address a massive problem while also having uh, a very strong business case behind it. Um, just to put it in perspective, number one was building efficiency and number seven was the electric car. Uh, so it's quite interesting to see that. And with his uh, business partner, Kevin, they essentially decided to found uh, Window. So really what we saw is, is that you know, each year, one third of all the food um, prepared for human consumption actually ends up in the right? So this is from farm to fork essentially. So you're talking about from you know, fields um, where there are food waste and food loss occurring because of cosmetic standards um, from retailers, from weak supply chains, insufficient supply chains, um, like lack of infrastructure, cold chains, things like this, where loss is occurring, um, all the way through to the essentially the handlers of food where food uh, waste is occurring from preparation, um, from simply food that is left on uh, the plates of customers and possibly your plates today, so hopefully you finish up all your food. Um, but actually the, the, the situation this year is, is massive, um, and that one third figure is, uh, is actually unfortunately growing. But what we do see is that 1.6 billion tons of food is actually wasted per year. Uh, now, I've tried before to kind of equate this in terms of buildings, in terms of ships, in terms of many things. It's a pretty hard figure to kind of put, wrap your mind around, right? Uh, just because it's such a large number. And that's every single year. Financially, what we see is that that's a one trillion dollar issue, um, with the hospitality industry alone contributing 100 billion. So when we, we know, really started looking and seeing, okay, what was the impact that we could have? We figured at least we could start with the hospitality industry because this is where we could see ourselves making the most impact, because it wasn't addressed there yet. Um, and actually, when we look at the environmental side, those losses um, in terms of food uh, really equate to, if we look at greenhouse gases, is actually the third largest greenhouse gas emitter behind the US and China, if it was a country. Right? So it is absolutely a massive issue. 
So from that, you know, we really came up with what is our belief as a company? What do we really genuinely want to solve? And what do we want to change? Um, our belief really was is that food is simply too valuable to waste. Right? The amount of resources, the amount of time it takes to even just grow food, to the time it takes and you know, the, the more resources it takes to get that food from the fields to your plates is absolutely massive. Right? From the chefs that we work with, from you know, all the teams, all the um, everyone that we work with, it's just too valuable to waste. Right? And it's the one thing that is a common denominator for all of us, outside of say water and air. Right? We're able to sit down, we all have to eat, and it's something that we all can share. Right? So it is too valuable. So then that came up with, kind of, that was our belief, and our mission um, is essentially to connect commercial kitchen, create a movement of chefs, just make people understand that food, that food is too valuable to waste, right? And we wanted to take an innovative approach in doing so by going into commercial operations, to traditional kitchens, bringing technology in to shed light on the fact that there is waste occurring, to give them an easy way of doing so. So fortunately enough, um, we were able to, in the six years, we were able to create this movement. Right? We were able to get chefs on board. We were able to get industry leaders on board um, to start looking at food differently. Um, so we had started in London. Now today, we're essentially all over the world. We have offices in Dubai, Shanghai, um, Singapore, Bangkok, now in the US, and we'll be opening up Australia this year. Um, we do work in four main verticals in the hospitality sector. Um, the first is in contract catering. So that's like your staff canteens, uh, schools, hospitals, things like this. Um, we work with the likes of SAP, um, Nike, Apple, um, these types of campuses, and looking at food for their, their staffs and for their teams. Um, so that's one area. In Asia, where we work a lot with is hotels. Um, hotels, I mean, if you go to any hotel here in Bangkok, you go to the, you know, the, the main restaurant, they're all day dining, massive buffets. Right? This is unlike anywhere else in the world, except for maybe the Middle East, um, where it's also a massive operation. But in terms of Europe, in terms of the US, you don't see these massive buffets like you see here in Asia. Uh, so that's kind of where we put our focus on. And, and we work very closely uh, with the four hotels actually um, to help them reach their target of reducing food waste by 30% globally by next year. Um, we do see more and more groups actually taking an initiative and setting public targets to be able to reduce this as well. Uh, Marriott Hotels has set a target to reduce by 50% by 2025. Uh, Hilton as well by 50% by 2025. Um, so we are seeing more and more multinational, uh, essentially the largest operators in the world to take a stand against food waste. Um, outside of the hotels, we work at restaurants. Um, our largest restaurant client is IKEA. Um, so IKEA is very sustainability focused, and essentially what we're doing is we're trying to save the meatballs. For them. Um, you know, they have a bistro in each one of their stores, um, and we're essentially able to help them um, mitigate this waste issue there. And last but not least, which is the Pretty much the king of all wasters is cruise line industry. Right? So we work closely with Carnival Cruise Lines, Coast of Cruise Lines, and you know, if you've ever been on a cruise before, 3,000, 4,000 people in an all-inclusive type setting for four, three, four days out to sea, massive volume of production and also massive volume of waste. Um, so we are working closely with the cruise line industry as well to address this. Now I want to take it back um, and, and essentially focus more on the hotel side. Right? Um, you know, Thailand, is, well essentially Bangkok is the most visited city in the world, right? And hospitality is essentially number one, right? So, so what I want to do is have a look at hotels. What we actually see is, is when looking at the issue of food waste in hotels specifically, you can see that up to 4 to 12% on average of their total cost is actually food waste, it's actually waste. Right? We see on the high end that this could be up to 20%, but really that main area there is about 4% to 12% being purely waste. That essentially is just lost off their off their business, lost off their field. Um, so it's it's a massive issue, um, but it's one that we can solve. And when we break that four to twelve percent down, uh, essentially in terms of the cost, we can then look at where is the waste actually coming from. And we see four areas primarily uh, of wastage. Um, that first being spoilage. So that's simply things that are going you know going off in the refrigerators, things that are rotten, whatever it may be. But we see quite little of this, typically because chefs can manage the inventories, um, they have visibility over the inventory much better um, than, say, other areas. The second area that we see uh, is preparation waste. So this is just unavoidable losses, oftentimes unavoidable, of you know, preparing food, right? So the scraps from, say, meat trimmings, 
fruits, vegetables, whatever it may be. Um, these are also the preparation ways. This is also quite small. Um, this can be controlled typically through proper training and essentially getting the maximum yield out of raw products. The largest, absolutely largest area though, where we see food waste occur is overproduction. And what we call overproduction is essentially food that is completely edible, uh, but essentially is never eaten. Right? So, so say your buffet line. The food that is left on the buffet line at the end of a service after you've left, uh, that essentially nobody has touched, but is completely edible. Um, this all is a massive, massive source of waste, especially for the hotel sector. So this is where we see the largest. And last but not least is plate waste. Right? So this is simply what is left on the plates um, after the consumer has, has, uh, has finished eating. Right? So maybe what's on your plates right now. I don't know. I'm looking around. Um, but that's, that's also another source that we see. Um, and then essentially when we look at it, we, look at, we take those four areas of waste and we we'll break it down into two business models. Um, what we call prepared in advance, which is essentially your buffets and your banqueting operations. And then your cook to order, which is more of your a la carte type of operation. In prepared in advance, by far, overproduction is where we see the largest amount of waste. On the cook-to-order side, we see much less waste in terms of volume, and the majority of that is coming from the, the customer's plate. Um, and that's simply because we're cooking to order, we're preparing um, as the orders are coming in, and essentially what's left on the plate can be oftentimes over-portioning, or maybe uh, the customer just doesn't like the food. So this is, these are kind of the areas that we see um, waste on the plate. So, you know, we have all this information, how do we break down the waste, how much is it costing the operation, but how do we understand it? Uh, and, and traditionally, I guess, it has been quite tricky to understand, uh, because the original approach would be to take whatever may be left on, you know, on the buffet line, or say on the plate, go over to, say, a digital scale, weigh that food, take a pen and a piece of paper, write down what it may be, uh, write the name of the item down, the weight, where did it come from, etc. Um, and do that for each item that's thrown away. This is an extremely time-consuming process, right? Especially in hotels where things, you know, the service is switching around, say, buffet ends at 10.30, they need to be ready for lunch at 11. To have somebody stand there and write down food waste transactions can be quite time-consuming, right? So this is a challenge. And if we see that it's too time-consuming, people just won't do it in the long run. It becomes much more challenging that way. And that's essentially what we at Window wanted to go in and solve, is really addressing this tracking process uh, to help that. So, I guess, you know, one of the interesting things, and I guess why we're here today is, what if we could use artificial intelligence to do that? So, to, to simplify this tracking process while still providing very in detail analytics, uh, and essentially making the issue of food waste much smaller, right, within, a, within an operation. What that would give us, if we use an, uh, artificial intelligence, is accurate data, uh, which can be validated, by, let's say, image recognition. Um, as I said before, increased ease of use, which is what we wanted to address. So shortening that time to uh, track food as it's being wasted. Um, and essentially automate that data collection process to essentially eliminate humans out of the equation. Right? So we eliminate error as well. We essentially just have a system that is in place that is taught to be able to do these transactions. And so what I want to show you is essentially, you know, when we think about artificial intelligence, think about a couple of things. The first, Skynet, Terminator, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger, Skynet is taking over the world, they control everything, the robots are coming for us. This is what we think of when we first think of artificial intelligence. Um, it's a funny way to think about it, but it's, it's kind of the first kind of glimpse into artificial intelligence that we have. It's much, much more than that. Um, so really, you know, what we see is, is, is essentially two branches of, of artificial intelligence. Now, Skynet and the Terminator is something we call artificial general intelligence. So this is essentially just a machine that just thinks on its own, right? And it just thinks to think, and it thinks about what is the best way to do it in its own kind of process, its own approach. What we work in is artificial narrow intelligence. And that's essentially giving um, an algorithm a, uh, a directive, right? And then having that directive be its purpose. And then from that, we can go into a couple different deeper levels of, uh, of artificial intelligence, like say machine learning, where we're essentially feeding just direct data sets into uh, a system and defining what are the features of say something that we want um, the computer to recognize moving forward, um, down to deep learning, right? So while we're not just teaching the features, but having the system start to recognize what are those features itself, right? But then also supervising it so that we ensure that it's 
once it's recognizing its own features, it's recognizing the right things. Right? So we're supervising and essentially teaching, keeping a close hand on to it so it doesn't you know, start thinking for its own and become Skynet. Um, and essentially from that supervised learning, we go drive it down into something that we call um, computer vision. And that's essentially image recognition. Right? So taking an AI algorithm and teaching it to understand what images look like and what, the, what is inside those images and how to define those images as they come up or are fed into the data stream. So computer vision is a fast-growing form of artificial intelligence. And what we saw in 2011 was pretty much the emergence of computer vision as a type of technology um, and, a, and a branch of artificial intelligence. And actually, there's um, every year, there is a, what, we, there, what is called the ImageNet Challenge. And essentially, there are teams from all around the world that are brought in to essentially develop a part of computer vision algorithm to essentially understand images as it comes out uh, within the frame of, uh, of this competition, right? And see how accurate they could be. In 2011, um, this challenge was at 26% errors, where we see now, in 2018, it actually had, is actually at 3% error. So it's massively accurate. What we see with humans is typically about a 5% error. And the thing with humans that is different from a computer is, is essentially we are subjective. Right? We, are not, we are not told what is the right thing or what is the wrong thing. We are told, but we make our own assumptions after that, right? Mom and dad can tell us what is the right thing to do, but we don't necessarily listen to it. With the computer, typically if we tell it what to do, it will do that, right? Unless it's determined. So, so yeah, so we see a, a higher increase in, uh, in the image, uh, because essentially I could ask anybody in the room, you know, what is that over there? And you could, I could say something, and then you could also say something, right? So we have our own essentially definition of what we're looking at. And that's really the difference. But with computer vision, we teach it to understand and to know exactly what we need it to do. So these are a few examples of uh, computer vision. Um, so visual inspection, right? So this could be like production lines. So these are um, you know, production line that's outfit with uh, computer vision technology, essentially a camera, um, able to detect defects in different products, right? So looking and see where are the scratches, um, where is the chip, the dent, whatever it may be, um, so that the quality standards are maintained. Um, so that's one way that uh, computer vision is used. Another is facial recognition, right? If you use an iPhone, now you just look at your phone and the phone opens up automatically. That's also computer vision. Um, another one is essentially Facebook. When you tag, you post a picture on Facebook and you want to tag your friends, oftentimes it already knows who those friends are. Right? You always wonder, well, how did that thing know that was, that was whoever? This is also uh, computer vision, this is a form of it. Um, one that's extremely interesting is actually in the medical field. Um, and it is helping cardiolo uh, sorry, radiologists um, and when looking at, um, looking at uh, x-rays, right? And looking and seeing what, say, tumors look like. Um, and helping those doctors identify those tumors in a much more pragmatic way, right? In a much more practical way. Um, so that's one that is massive. And then last but not least, in, which is this coming soon, um, self-driving cars, right? So those cars are able to um, look at images from all around, say from 360, and being able to navigate and to maneuver um, those cells through, uh, through image detection, object detection, things like this, also computer vision. Um, but we, we at Wayno, we're one of the few companies here that are using it to look at food waste in kitchens. Um, so very different from all these four, but, um, but still, I think, uh, a good cause, in a way. So, so, yeah, so that's pretty much computer vision. Um, but I guess kind of our journey at Wayno and, and how we brought computer vision into the commercial kitchen um, was also a long one. So as I showed, in 2011 was when computer vision first came out. In 2013, we saw those algorithms and essentially the software side be in a place that we could start building off of. Right? So that's about five years ago. Um, and essentially, moving from there, we then had to say, okay, if we have the software, do we have the hardware to be able to, uh, to do so? And, and that wasn't until about 2015 that we were actually able to, uh, to reach that point. And what we call this is um, it's essentially computing at the edge. I'll show you a video just after this of what the system looks like. But essentially, we needed to be able to process data um, as a system is capturing information, um, capturing images. We needed to be able to process it on site. So that's in a kitchen anywhere in the world. Process it there. Rather than having that system take an image, send it up to a server, send it back down, it takes too long. We need to process it there so that so the whole entire tracking process is much faster. Right? So once we solved um, software side, the hardware side, 
one of the most important things with artificial intelligence is data. Because um, you need data to be able to teach an algorithm essentially what it needs to know. Right? You need a lot of data, a lot of data. Um, so it's 2017, that's when we really brought things up to scale. And we as a company at Winnow were essentially large enough um, to have enough data streams from all around the world to feed the algorithm and essentially teach that system what food looks like, pretty much. Um, so that's really where we were. Bringing it into today, 2019, um, where we actually are bringing this, this type of technology and this type of uh, artificial intelligence into the kitchen. So this is just to show you um, kind of a, just a, a mock-up of what, uh, what it looks like. Um, so this is the window terminal. So essentially, it's a tablet, an uh, Android-driven tablet. Um, it's fixed in with um, a NVIDIA uh, Jetson TX2 graphics card. If anybody is into cryptocurrency, this is what they use for Bitcoin mining. Um, These are the same cards. It's a very strong graphics card. Uh, and, then, and then that it has a, a motion camera, a motion sensor camera that's attached to it. And essentially, it just looks over um, a bin. And then under that bin is just a scale, a smart scale. And the process is any, every time food is thrown away, the system will take a picture of what that food is, and then quickly, within a couple seconds, recognize that food. Um, and then from there, we capture essentially big data on food waste, transform that into consolidated analytics that chefs and their teams can then use on a daily and weekly basis to then start driving change um, because they're equipped with information to that help them do so. So this is just a <coughs> video. Well, anyways, the sound's not working. Tech, tech company with tech problems. So, anyways, so this was a this is actually an introduction video that we um, that we did to introduce Winner Vision. Um, and essentially, we did this video in partnership with IKEA um, and Emar Hospitality. Um, to bring out the system, and essentially they were our, our beta testers for this. So there's about 100 sites in total um, that we started to bring in computer vision in for. Um, and, and yeah, so Imar Hospitality is a massive hotel group, um, or a hotel owning group, um, lots of properties at Rotana. Um, they own the Armani Hotel at the Burj Khalifa. Um, they essentially are one of the largest hotel operators in the Middle East. IKEA on the other side, of course, you all know, um, they are also very sustainably focused. And they wanted to be a part of this journey in bringing this. So this is the real system. Um, so this is fixed onto a wall. This is Mark. And essentially, um, it is a camera that is in housed inside this terminal. And what happens is that when food is thrown away, um, the system will compare the image to, um, to the current image. So the last image to the current image to first see what is the difference. From there, um, we then essentially put in segmentation and layering um, through the algorithm, the AI algorithm. So that at a granular level, we can start to understand food. Um, and actually, this is a real, yeah, this is a real transaction. So you just throw the food in, the system takes a picture of it, and is able to recognize it once the system is trained up. Um, so even here, you can see um, the system is getting so accurate now that we can tell different things like um, pork meatballs versus vegetable meatballs, or say carrots, um, types of carrots. Is it peeled carrots, julienne carrots, um, cooked carrots, things like this, um, lemons, rotten lemons, sliced lemons, whole lemons. It's all these types of things. Um, so as more and more data, and as essentially we see more and more food um, on a daily basis kind of be wasted, unfortunately, 
um, the system is, is then essentially getting smarter. And then from that data, we can then provide better analytics to those teams to then start reducing. Um, but pretty much that's how it works. And yeah, so it's a smart scale um, with a bin on top and then that terminal that's there. And essentially food is thrown away and we capture information on each single transaction. From there, we then provide those analytics um, to show them exactly what it is. And in real time, we're showing them not only what the food is, how much to the weigh, but also the direct cost as well, which is a big, big factor. Um, and this is actually one thing that we see in, in raising awareness on the sites as well, um, showing the cost. Because, you know, especially, say like in Thailand, where a hotel salary may be about 15,000 baht, something like this, and say in a five-star hotel, you throw away a piece of, say, primary, right? That's a lot of money, maybe 500, 600 baht worth, maybe more. Right? So then somebody seeing that kind of startles them. I mean, it's a lot. Right? There's a lot in terms of a monthly salary. There's a lot in terms of really anything. Um, so it starts to kind of get people to think differently about how they see food. Um, so this is just kind of one way, just in terms of the real time, um, how the system is able to kind of raise that awareness and drive some change. Um, so as I said before, yeah, it's just a terminal with a camera um, in, and then that smart scale. So these are actually real pictures. Um, so, so these are the before pictures, um, essentially the image of before the next transaction is done, before the next food is thrown away. In the top one, um, right here you'll see, say, fish and chips. Um, and those fish and chips are then um, detected. So the difference is then detected. They're just comparing the two images. Um, it's then outlined. And then an algorithm starts to go into, uh, into effect, um, what we call the overlay change. And, and then that is able to then distinguish the fish and chips. Um, this is the same right here. So this is a little bit deeper into the bin. You can't quite see it as well. But we see a little bit of a difference here. Um, and that is actually a period here chicken. Um, same idea, comparing the two images, the difference, um, and then providing that, uh, letting that algorithm go to work, and essentially determining what it is. Um, and the last picture here, extremely busy trash bin, right? You know, the trash bin is never nice and organized. I mean, when was the last time you actually looked inside the trash bin? You look at trash bins all day, it's filthy. Um, so, so here we can actually see a little bit of cake. Um, and then it'll, it'll do the, uh, the change detection. And then that last image there, what we'll see is, is that actually the system can tell that it's almond cake with dime, right? Because we're, we are, that's, that's directly from idea, right? Everybody gets their almond cake with dime compared to some person. Um, so the system is able to do that once it's trained up. And really, yeah, the virtuous cycle of AI, right? So we had to start somewhere. We started with 100 sites um, with this new system of vision, right? And we essentially had to get enough data to then be able to teach the system, right? So improving the, the product, essentially. From there, we then used that better product to then bring in more users who are then able to contribute more data to then essentially build what we call the taxonomy of food, um, which is what we're doing. And essentially, we are able to have um, essentially like a dictionary, uh, like, a, like a dictionary, right? of all the different types of food with essentially thousands upon thousands of images um, of food, well actually technically of food waste. And, and then from that, that system is getting more and more intelligent as more and more images are then contributed into the, uh, into the data stream. Um, bringing the product and bringing that information into kind of the, into a higher place um, and bringing on more users then start driving more and more change. So that's pretty much how the system kind of works, right? But how do we reduce food waste, right? It's like, great, we have artificial intelligence, great, it can recognize what food is, but how do we really drive change? Um, and that's the biggest thing. So what we do is we take a three-step process, right? So we address the record waste aspect with the system, right? And from there, we then start tracking the waste. And what we mean by tracking the waste is using those analytics, using that data to essentially determine exactly where the losses occur in each and every day, right? Where are those hot points? What is being left on um, the buffet the most, right? Or what is, you know, what are those items that are, we can look at anything from, um, say, when are items being discarded the most, to where are they coming from, um, to specifically what are those items. And from that, because chefs are busy people, they don't have time essentially to look into this. They can have an idea of how much to produce based on occupancy, based on, um, you know, based on their forecasting, but essentially it's not perfect. So what we essentially want to do is, is help them create a bookend, right? So when they know how much they're producing, and then we can provide them information on how much they're wasting, to essentially squeeze down 
and narrow down exactly how much our customer is going to be consuming. Um, and that's kind of where it is. That's one way that we're actually able to do that. Um, and through that data, making those changes and then driving those um, reductions. And on average, we're reducing waste um, typically between 40 to 70 percent. What we try to do is at least by half. Um, so this is just an example of some of the analytics. Um, so we're sending out reports on a daily, weekly basis. Um, chefs can also look on, uh, say, a mobile device on, uh, on the computer, so they don't have to be directly in front of the system to be able to see when waste is occurring. Uh, and this is in real time. So typically we'll send them a report um, early in the morning from the previous day so they can use this in their daily briefing. So then they can start already um, making changes to the production for that day. Um, and looking at those, those kind of those hot points in terms of waste. So this is a, just a graph of what we see, what we really see in terms of food waste reductions across um, a full year. And it happens in three phases. So the first phase, essentially, um, where the 100% mark is, is essentially your baseline. Right? So we'll come in and we'll do a study first to understand what is wastage like at a site uh, initially. So then we can, we can look and see what is the trend afterwards. Um, so typically from that first four months, we can see the largest reduction in food waste. That's simply because um, you know, these hot points we're bringing in best practice, bringing in operational controls, working with the team to then kind of fine tune uh, the operation a bit more and then really drive those strong reductions. In that second phase, um, in the next four months, what we see is, is we see some smaller reductions, um, but still steady. But this essentially is diving deeper into um, that data, right? And looking at things like, um, say, what is not moving on a buffet? Or you're starting to dig deeper even into who are your clients, right? Understanding the clients and understanding where clients enjoy eating or they don't enjoy eating. Right? Some hotels have certain, uh, you know, certain nationalities that frequent those hotels more than others. Right? Are you preparing food in line with those tastes? Nobody likes to eat the same thing. Right? So we have to try and dig deeper and then really squeeze out even more reductions. In that third phase, what we see is we kind of see this, um, this graph kind of bottom out. Right? It becomes a bit more stabilized. Um, where we want the, essentially the system to become a control point, right? a monitoring tool ongoing monitoring tool. Because we see in the hospitality, uh, hospitality industry, one, uh, turnover, staff turnover is massive, right? So we see chefs leaving, we see different um, line level employees leaving. So the operation is changing quite often with people that are coming in and out. And so we want this to ensure that you know, the system is also able to control that. And you know, with all the hard work that the teams have done in the past, say, eight months, to maintain those across no matter what changes. So using that as a control mechanism. Um, so this is just kind of um, some Thailand, um, some Thailand data for you to have a look at. Um, so, so what we'll use is, is a couple metrics. Um, the first is food waste as a percentage of uh, net food sales, of sales, right? So it's similar to say a, a food cost percentage, but in this case we're looking at a food waste cost percentage. Um, on average, what we see is typically between two to four percent um, of wastage. In this case, when we break it down to mid-scale luxury, we see anywhere between about 3.38 to 2.59 um, at the baseline. Right? Um, what we see in, say, this is March 2019, those reductions being about 72% in Thailand in the mid-scale segment, um, about 40% in the upscale, and almost about 70% in the luxury segment as well. Um, what we really focus on is driving reductions in value uh, as opposed to in volume. So focusing on this, on the uh, say the overproduction things like this, on those most expensive items, really drive those. Um, in terms of the waste value, so this is just your gross cost. Um, you see uh, just over uh, forty thousand baht in the mid scale, up to the forty five thousand baht in the luxury, um, which is actually quite interesting because even when I saw this for the first time, you would think that the luxury segment actually has much higher, uh, much higher wastage costs, right? Because you essentially, between mid-scale and luxury, you're throwing away lobster versus chicken. Right? And that's actually what we see oftentimes. Uh, but in this case, maybe you know, it could be that, say, the mid-scale segment is throwing away more in volume um, as well. It really depends. Um, but then that comparison, you know, we do still see those reductions of about 40% in the mid-scale upscale segments, um, and then just that 55% in the luxury segment as well. Uh, and this is based on 25 hotels here in time. Now when we look at, um, in terms of volume, so we actually see something quite interesting, um, where, yeah, as I mentioned before, you know, the mid-scale segment throwing away a lot more in terms of the amount of food that is not necessarily the value. Um, and then we also saw something quite funny, actually, 
where, where we saw that kilograms, um, say in March, actually spike up. Now, oftentimes, this is, uh, we contribute this to something like plate weights, right? Where we can, as an operation, we can control how much we're putting out, but we can't control how much people are taking. Right? And then this is a very, very challenging thing. Um, there are things that you can do, um, say, like smaller plates, how do you design layout of buffet, um, to um, having messaging from chefs. Um, we've actually seen this be quite effective, is having a personal message from the chef saying that they're undertaking um, you know, a process to reduce food waste. They kind of just ask you to join with them and take what you need. Right? Um, so there's a lot of different things. The plate waste is something that is very hard to control. Uh, it's essentially you know, it's out of, it's almost out of your hands. Um, whereas the pre-consumer waste, you can control 100%. So yeah, so um, just kind of wrapping up, you know, what we saw these reductions, you know, we wanted to bring in technology that is innovative, um, that is able to help these properties uh, essentially equip them with insightful data to then drive those reductions, right? We see that waste can be reduced by 40 to 70 percent, on average about 55 percent, and unfortunately enough, we've been able to help just over 1,300 kitchens um, around the world do so um, with this technology. Um, so from the likes of ISG, um, here just at Tani, World Bank of Sports Club across the street, Marriott, Core, um, you name it, a lot of different partners. Um, and right now we're saving our clients about $30 million uh, each year in just food um, that doesn't go to waste. So, uh, that means about 35 million meals each year that is that are not wasted. Which means that we're actually able to save one meal every two seconds. Um, and in terms of CO2E, that's about 42,000 tons of CO2E being generated. And our target now is, is we're trying to get to a point where we can generate $1 billion of savings for our clients by 2025. Um, so we've yeah, still got six years, so still a lot of work to do. Um, but that is, is essentially our goal. Um, so please, my final note is help show the world that food is too valuable to waste. Join the fight. Whatever it may be, whether it's in your home or when you go out to try. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I just did not finish all of your food. <laughs> 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 I need to finish my as well. So now it's time for Q&A. Before I have first questions. Yep, sure. um, I'm wondering about the applications of the technologies in different, different types of food. Like, for example, like if you put a camera to detect like Western food, like for example, fish and chips, and Apple broccoli, yep. that would be relatively easy for a to detect. But for example, in the food here, if I throw away like pad thai and yeah. like, thai food, is, 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 it, is it applicable for yeah. that small? Yeah, absolutely. So so the process that we take with each region that we go into, we take this into account, even say in Asia, food is different, right? From China, Thailand to Vietnam, wherever it may be. Um, what we're actually doing is, is that we're annotating every single image that comes in on our back end. So we have localized teams uh, in each, say, each office, uh, each regional office, that are essentially looking at images all day as they come in, um, and essentially ensuring that, yes, is this in fact a Pad Thai, um, or is this in fact a Masama, right? So that we're ensuring that the data and the images that we're feeding into the algorithm are 100% correct, so that we are teaching the, essentially the application uh, the right, the right things. Questions from Hi, I'd like to take a second question. So, um, it's similar to what Kunwasi just asked. You said that the accuracy of the camera is quite accurate, that as you can tell the difference of carrots if it's grated or diced or whole carrot. What about if it's something that's very, very similar, like if it's grated radish or turnip, or if it's grated gouda or um, shedda, something that is so similar? Yeah. Is, is it that accurate they can tell the difference, or is it still, is still a challenge? Yeah, so it, it is it is a challenge in one way, but actually what we do is is that we'll have a training process for each time we go into a new site. So we want to train the system up to understand what the food for, say, that particular site looks like. And, and what we'll do is, is we'll take uh, a process where the team essentially will throw the food away, and then just tap on the screen initially, say for the first two to three months, um, of what those items are that are being discarded. So then it essentially will start to learn exactly what that gluta does look like, or what, say, a, a mild cheddar or something like this does look like. So there is a training aspect involved in, in each new site that we go to. But for, say, simple things like apples, scrambled eggs, uh, 
uh, whatever it may be, the system has already learned those items. And it's essentially expanding on that taxonomy um, with each new site that we go in to then kind of you know, have more definitions um, for those images that, that are coming. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And my second question is basically, what is the cost of window vision and um, what what does this cost include? Does it include consulting or just the tech or what's the package? Yeah, so um, so what we do is we work on the SaaS model, uh, software as a service. Right? So we provide all the hardware for any site that we're going into. So the cameras, the terminal, um, except for the trash bit, um, which we can provide if people want it, but, um, <laughs> but mainly you know, supply your own trash bit. Um, so we provide all the hardware for this. And typically the cost will be about $700 a month. Um, for that, plus you know, we're doing initial uh, initial fees for say training, um, which we're coming in training teams not only on how to use the system but on the topic of food waste as well, um, and really establishing the the why, right? Because this is also something that we see that we, we must do in raising awareness, but also providing a why behind it. why are we actually addressing this issue? Um, but yeah, so it's typically about seven hundred dollars um, a month, but then we do also scale this um, depending on say annual food because we want to essentially have the system to be in line with, with the operation. We don't want to oversell and have this big monster of a thing, um, which is say a smaller operation. So we can scale it. Thank you. Any other questions? So, so typically in say um, a hotel kitchen for example, say like one all the dining outlet will put in um, one, one system. Um, so that will be one system where it's tracking all those items from there. Um, it will typically be near like a dishwashing station. Um, it will be programmed with the whole menu of, of, the, um, of that outlet. And then essentially we'll just ask that the, in that bin it's just only food waste that is going in. So we're asking for the, the trash to be segregated um, in that case. Now we do see with say much larger operations, um, the need to have multiple um, units within, say, one same outlet. For example, uh, Marina Bay Sands. We work with Marina Bay Sands there, massive operation. Um, we'll have two, and that's simply just because of the volume of, of food waste that is coming back, um, just to ensure that essentially the, you know, the process is not slow. But then those systems are cloned, and then they'll do the same, essentially the same data feed into the same uh, report that way. Um, so it's just kind of uh, just to look at efficiency. Typically, one outlet, one system. Um, I'm coming back to one of your first slides where you show um, the biggest waste uh, on, for example, for preparation, right? Uh, you said it's like the buffet that they overproduce. Yeah. And here I, um, I see that the system can clearly uh, help to, um, to, for the future planning to reduce the amount. But then you say, uh, uh, you know, cook for order. Uh, the biggest waste is actually what's the leftover on the plate. Yeah. Um, how can widow tackle this problem? Because not everybody leaves the same food yeah. left over on the plate. Yeah, so what we've seen is, um, with our cart operation specifically, is what we'll do is we'll run uh, plate audits um, so essentially we'll program it so you have all the menu items on there and then, and then we're able to see, we can compare with say a sales report, um, how many of, you know, say a certain dish you have, uh, you have sold and then over that period how much waste has been generated from those. So we teach the system what that dish looks like, whether it's you know, mixed up with say beef, vegetables, whatever it may be, teaching that system what that looks like and then we'll be able to see essentially, uh, say in the recipe, you, know, you have the whole, the whole dish may be say 600 grams. Uh, as an example, we can then we can then compare and say, okay, well, we saw that um, five kilograms have been discarded over the entire week. How many dishes did we sell? And then we can look and see what is the overportioning potential um, of this, or people just maybe eating it, and so maybe that wastage is so high that people are getting this dish and they're not actually eating it. So then going back and then maybe even doing uh, portion control or menu engineering um, in, in and out of part of like that. In terms of the um, business case. A la carte is definitely um, much more challenging um, to look at. 
um, whereas kind of the buffet operation, just because of the volume, um, it's a bit easier to, to kind of justify um, putting the system. How does the, the system knows, uh, know when, um, at which stage the food is being wasted, like, like, like preparation, storage, I guess? Uh, yeah, so, so what we can do is, depending on the operation, we can put, say, um, a level into, into the system. Uh, what I mean by that is, is, say when something is thrown away and it recognizes it, the person can then tap on where is that coming from. Um, where, because we have, say, different systems, we have, it may be tracking you know, the spoilage, the preparation, kind of all these different types of, of levels of wastage. Um, or maybe it's just coming back from the thing. Um, so we can kind of we can program it to essentially be able to be chosen um, what this is as well. And it's similar for like banqueting operations. Um, we do the same. Alright, so we can see um, whether it's a wedding event or it's a coffee break or maybe what type of um, what event room did it come from, things like this. Um, so we're not limited as to just it taking a picture and then capturing the data, but we can also define where the source is. So please join me. Thank you much.